Good morning, everyone. We are awake at 8.30, I love it. All right, it's my privilege to welcome you to the H. Orton Wiley Lecture Series. Today's session will go for 50 minutes, which may allow time for Q&A at the end, so we'll ask you to stay the entire time. If you do have to leave, please slip out quietly for us. It's been our pleasure to welcome Dr. Brian Bantam to be with us this week. Today is the last of a series of lectures that he's been giving. He is Associate Professor of Theology at Seattle Pacific University. His work throughout the course of his career has been focused on the intersections of race and identity and religion. He has published on that topic, and if you look in your brochures, you can see some of his uh, works that he has published. The overall lecture series that we've been considering this week has been, Who Will We Be? Doing Theology as Though Our Bodies Mattered. Today's session, it's called We With God, What If Salvation Is Not a Place? Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Bantam? Thank you so much. Good morning. Oh, there are a lot of you. This is great. I was afraid to look, look behind me. Um, it's so good to see you all this morning. And um, I just have to say, it's just, it's just been a, really, a, a real pleasure to be with you all um, this week. Um, Dr. Kelly's hospitality and um, consummate organization um, has been amazing. Um, your questions and your presence and your enthusiasm um, means a lot to me. Um, for those of us um, who, who do a lot of our work reading and writing in rooms and, and kind of put stuff out there to actually have people come um, and, and listen to it is, is um, you can, I can't say how much that means to us um, for that. So I want to thank you all for being here um, this week. Um, I also just want to point out, you've, you've now over the course of three days witnessed the evolution of Dr. Bannum's clothes over the course of a quarter. So first day, tie, sharp, looking like, looking tight. Second day, things are loosening up a little bit. We still got the leather shoes, but by the last day, so this is my last two weeks of the quarter usually. Sneakers, shirts out, let's just get done. Let's be done. Finish strong. So, um, but I'm thankful to be here. But, I'm, but I feel, hey, I kind of fit in now. I feel like I was a little out of place on Monday, but, um, but it all works out. So what I want to talk to us today about is begin to thinking about this idea of what does it mean to say um, salvation is not a place. And over the course of the last few days, I've been talking a little bit about this idea of God as a God of difference and likeness, that God is a God of movement. Um, and I've, I've been hearing a little bit of, of like, well, what do you mean that like God changes? God changes. like, well, no, actually, what I'm not meaning is that God changes. What I'm saying is that God is movement, which means that change is not um, strange to God. Or I, sh I should say, our experience of change is not strange to God. Um, and so those are slightly two different ways of thinking about it. To say, wait a second, what does it mean to say that our understanding, our life, our culture, our ways of living are fundamentally always going to change? And that God that actually is natural to who God is. That it works inside of God's own life. And then we talked a little bit about what, is, what does this mean in terms of being made in the image of God, that we are ourselves difference in likeness, bound to the ground, bound to God, bound to one another. Um, but this is not simply kind of about a kind of state of being, but it is about a way of being, a way of being with one another, a way of being with God, a way of being with creation. And that yet in this fallenness, this way of being becomes distorted, it becomes consumptive, it becomes oppressive, it becomes violent differentiation that is both grounded in my individual way of inhabiting the world, but also in social systems that fragment, distort, and dehumanize us. And so in the midst of this, what then will God do? How does God draw creation back into God's self, back into this pattern of living and being the image of God? God becomes like us. God becomes enfleshed. God becomes bodied. God subjects God's self to the particularities of our language, of our culture, of social systems, and enters into those social systems and performs our humanity for us. But because of the nature of who this person is as the one who creates all things and now who becomes like us who are created, that performance of his life communicates something to our lives. 
makes right, makes straight those crooked lines, enters into the social systems of differentiation between male and female, between Jew and Gentile, poor and rich, and begins to draw in underneath the surface a new way of being, a new way of imagining ourselves. So much so that God follows us in these patterns of human living, even into our deaths. So that when he is lying there in the tomb on Saturday, we can truly say there is no place that God has gone, that God, that we are, that God has not taken into himself. And then upon that Easter Sunday, the risen Christ appears transfigured, new, the divine, the human flashing in between, back and forth in such a way that we see not only God's redemption, God's new humanity, but we also see our new humanity. We see what we are and what we will be in the resurrected Christ. And so now the question becomes, what does salvation mean? If in in, in sense, what salvation, what the redemption was not simply about a moment on the cross that somehow pays a debt and allows us to get into get out of jail free. What if instead, from the very moment of that consumption, God was already saving us? From every step that he took, from every moment, every person he encountered, every bite of food that he ate, every prayer that he uttered, God was weaving salvation into our bodies. So then the question becomes, what now? What does this look like? This is all fine and good, Dr. Bannum, but frankly, life still kind of sucks. We still see oppression. We still see violent differentiation. We still feel the dehumanization of our own bodies. Is this just a nice idea? But in fact, I want to suggest, I want us to think for the next few minutes between two particular moments. The first moment is thinking about this idea of salvation not as a place, but a way. Now, the passage that I'm thinking about here is the way that the, the numerous times that Jesus um, tells his disciples, tells crowds throughout his ministry, the kingdom of God is here. He doesn't say it's going to be, right? He says it's already here. Well, they probably all looked around and they said, I don't see, this, <laughs> if this is the kingdom of God, you suck. Right? So it's not a place. So what is it that Jesus means? Perhaps what Jesus is saying is, look at me talking to you right now. Look at us sharing these things. Look at the ways that you've dropped everything to follow me. And that the ways in which your everyday patterns of life are now bound to my ways and patterns of life. Look at the people whom we've met. Look at the people whom we've drawn into ourselves. Look at the people that we've resisted, that we've shouted against that we've told no, the kingdom of God is here. What if salvation isn't a place, but a way? A way of living, a way of abiding, a way of hearing, a way of listening, a way of imagining our lives wrapped up and sewn into the lives of other people in such a profound way that we kind of, we lose a sense of who we are in them, in the other. And we risk changing. We risk letting go of privileges. We risk being the person that doesn't know the language. We risk being the person that doesn't know what to do next so that someone else can tell us what our life ought to look like. Or perhaps the kingdom of God is saying, look, I've had to bend every single day of my life. The kingdom of God is saying, God sees me as I am. I have a voice. I have a part to play in this. The kingdom of God is here. And I feel like we would see this kind of glimpsing of this moment um, after Jesus' ascension. As the disciples are gathered in that upper room, remember they're mourning, they're wondering what in the world has happened. This one who we thought was going to change everything just straight up and left us. That was an amazing run. Three years. We saw his body lift up to the sky. And he said something about God's going to send another counselor, but I don't even know what that means. 
And then what begins to happen? They're praying and they're believing and they're, and they're considering, they're mourning, they're grieving. And as they begin to recite and to think through this, the passages, the promises of God, they begin, their words begin to um, kind of scream out, to ring out of the room. And people who are, the Jews who are passing by, who are from all different parts of the Roman Empire, are suddenly amazed because why? They hear this language, they hear these promises in their own language, in their own tongues. What's happening here? I want to suggest to us that in this moment we see the inbreaking, or we should say the outbreaking, the veneer of salvation that was running underneath the surface, that God had been in a sense breathing, permeating into the bodies and lives of those whom he loves, bursting out of them. Because now what begins to happen? Peter and the other disciples are speaking in the language that they know right? They don't suddenly know other languages. They are speaking out of the particularity of their lives, the cultural moment. They're speaking out of their bodies, their moment. But what happens is the Spirit brings them, draws them into the reality of what it is that Christ has done and transforms that grammar into something new. It comes alongside and transforms their words into something miraculous, something multilingual, something multivocal, something that, in a sense, strips out, strips the grammatical capacity of the words that Peter is speaking. What does it mean to say theology, doing theology as though our bodies matter is not to say that we know what to do. Doing theology as though our bodies matter means what does it mean to say that God has already done the work? That God is already moving and shifting underneath your skin, in your bones, in your language, and wants to set you on fire so that your bodies begin to do a new kind of work. So that your lives can be heard in languages that are strange. That God comes alongside and suddenly it's not simply about what you know, but what it is that God can do through you. But this is not a place. This is a way. It is about softening our lives to a work that has already happened to us. So I want to tell a couple stories to kind of help us give a sense about what what this might look like. The first um, is my own kind of a little uh, my own kind of experience thinking through the life of the Spirit. I've mentioned a couple times. Um, my wife was uh, grew up Pentecostal. I grew up Southern Baptist, so I was a kind of person that believed that. You know, spiritual gifts were more like people were teachers and people were patient. Uh, my wife believed spiritual gifts were like healing, tongues, holy laughter, um, the whole thing. And so we're talking, and I'm like, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Um, and she's like, look, but have you spoken in tongues? I was like, no. And she's like, mm, mm-hmm. Because she grew up in a certain strand of belief that if you didn't speak in tongues, that you were not giving evidence of that internal transformation. That, in fact, if you were really saved, you were going to speak in tongues at some point in your life. Now, she's changed in her, in her understanding of this, but at the time, and she wasn't judgmental about it, but she just kind of like, mm-hmm, interesting. Um, and so, you know, but, so I was like, okay, well, I've, I've, I love you. So we started dating when we were sophomores in college, and I would drive up to Rochester, New York from um, Grantham, Pennsylvania, just outside of Harrisburg, and we'd go to church together, and she wasn't going to go to no dead church that I wanted to go to, so we go to the Pentecostal church, so I love you, we're going to your Pentecostal church. So we went to Bethel Full Gospel um, Church in downtown Rochester, I'm going to take this off for a second, because we just need this. So, so I walk in to, into Bethel Full Gospel, and my wife loves to be early, she's always going to be 15 minutes early. And so 15 minutes before anything starts, I'm like, I walk in, and there's some dude in the back like, yeah, that's Jesus. Yeah, that's Jesus. Mm-hmm. We're going to do this. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, gosh. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, 
the music starts and things are going and people are like, ah, and I'm just like, and so like, that's okay. I like, I worship God with my mind, right? So I'm just going to think about these words. I want to meditate upon them. And so, and so that was my first, like, my first day. And then I kept going back over and over and over again. Finally, by like this fourth, fifth month, I'm there. And I'm like, okay, like I'm, I'm kind of getting the sense of, I feel like the rhythm, I got the bass going, like, okay. So I'm just kind of, you know, I'm swaying. That's about as much as I got, my Southern Baptist out. And then all of a sudden, I start to feel my hand lift up. It is as though someone had grabbed hold of my thumb and was pulling my hand up. And I was like, um, no. <laughs> I love those people, but I'm not like them. Differentiation, right? I worship God with my mind. So I'm like, oh. And so finally it happens again. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do this, God. Ugh, oh, fine. And my wife looks over, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> this is God. She's like, okay, whatever, man. Okay, so finally, I'm like, and then, but as I did that, I started to realize that my body, my body became more open to something in that moment. So I'm not really like a this worshiper anymore. I'm more of like a, like this is my zone right here. But, but something kind of started to change in me. So fast forward a little bit. We graduate. We're going, I, I'm teaching Christian high school. There's a little Christian um, school in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. And uh, we have chapel a couple times a week. And the way that the, teacher, the teachers, we did this, like we kind of sat on the side. We had a teacher section of chapel. And then the students kind of did their thing. And then always at the end, there was a time for prayer. And so at this time of prayer, um, you know, teachers generally didn't go up for prayer. We talked about people who should go up for prayer <laughs> or people who were going up. Like, you know, you see Antoine, like, he, he, that boy needs to go for prayer. <laughs> why, isn't, why isn't our niece going up for prayer? Like, you know what she did the other day? So that was kind of like the way teachers, it was, we were super holy, but, you know, it, it was what it was. And so we're, so we're doing this, and all of a sudden I get this sense, like, I need to go up for prayer. And I'm like, I'm not trying to go for prayer. That's not what teachers do. We don't do that. That's not, we, we maintain a kind of dignity on the side and silently judge students. That's what we do. And so finally, like, my ed, the, my, I'm kind of getting edged out of my seat a little bit. And you know that, you know that feeling, right? You know that, that, that moment, you ever had that feeling? If you don't do something, you're basically giving God the finger, right? So you're like, fine. Ugh. So I go up. Talk to my past, talk, talk, talk to the chaplain. You know, I'm not, honestly, I'm not really sure why I'm up here. Um, I don't know what I have to pray for, um, but I feel like I need to come up for prayer. He's like, that's okay, my brother. You. So he puts his hand on me. Um, and as soon as he puts his hand on me, I, hear, I feel this like hot tingle move from his hand to my forehead all the way to my feet. Next thing I know, I'm on the floor. <laughs> Mr. Bantam got, Mr. Bantam got knocked out by the spirit. I'm like, what? What? What, what happened? Dr. Bantam, you got, Mr. Bantam, you got slain by the spirit. I was like, slain by the spirit? Yeah. Mr. Bantam, what'd you do? God must be pissed with you. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. So I go home and then Gail's like, how's your day? It's like, I don't know. I think I got slain by the spirit. She's like, what? You think you got slain by the spirit. You either did or you didn't. It's one or the other. And so I'm like, okay, I think, I'm pretty sure I got something by the Spirit. And so she's like, mm-hmm, interesting. So now fast forward 10 years. So it's been a long time. Um, we are, we're moving, we've moved to Seattle from Durham. Our first day, our first day in Seattle, we, um, and mind you, like, I'm leaving Durham. I'm leaving a place that I've lived for 10 years that was my home. I, I moved, we moved there when I was 23. Um, and it was like the first place where I felt like I was home, like I was me, like people saw me, like, like it was a really, really significant place for me and it was really scary to leave. And so we get to Seattle and we drop off our stuff in the house and we're kind of walking around the neighborhood immediately and we immediately know that we are not in Durham anymore. People don't look at you, <laughs> people don't smile. <laughs> It's, it's a weird place. Um, there's all white people everywhere. Something kind of a little bit like here. Sorry, I don't I mean, I'm sorry to mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'm used to it now. Um, 
So it's just strange. It's, just, it's really strange. So we drop off our stuff. Um, we go to Ikea because we need a bed, a lamp, you know, something to sleep in. Um, we come back a few hours later. We walk into the house, and we smell something. We're like, oh, what is that smell? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Like, boys, did somebody do something in the bathroom? No, we, did, we just peed. And so we, <laughs> it was probably too much information, but it's fine. Um, and so we start, like, sniffing around, and we go into one of the bathrooms, and there's crap everywhere. It's on the floor, it's in the sink, it's in the tub, everywhere. And, oh, this is gross, disgusting. And the thing that was worse about it was, I, so I'm cleaning it up, and I'm like, and what was worse was like, it wasn't even my family's. Oh. <laughs> if it was my family's, at least it'd be one thing, right? But no. So I'm cleaning it all up. It's on a Saturday. We call the, we call the pastor. We call the um, facilities people. They're like, oh my gosh, this is really weird. So they come out. They look at it like, I don't know. That's really strange. I'm not sure what happened. And they said, just use the downstairs bathroom. You'll be fine. So Sunday morning um, in Seattle in June, the sun comes up at like 3 o'clock in the morning. It's weird. And, and so the sun's up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And we hear this, gong, 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 gong. and my wife's like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. We run back to the bathroom, and it's all coming up again. Ah, uh, yeah, ugh. Oh. Clean it up again. And we were planning on going to this church. It's a really great church we heard, multi-ethnic, Quest Church. And so we were going to do that in the morning. And so I'm cleaning stuff up. I'm like, you can, it's always really fun to hear a theologian curse because it's a little unnatural. Unless you're Stanley Harros, but that's a theology joke. Um, so, I don't know, how much time do I have? I'm running out of time, sorry. <laughs> I like this story. Um, and so, what then happens is then we, we, we clean all this stuff up, and my wife is like, look, you need to, we don't need to go to church this morning. We're like, like it's just, like, you're clearly upset. It's our first Sunday here. We can go out. Of, I was like, no, we need to go to church or else... I'm going to freaking kill somebody. <laughs> so we go to church. Um, Quest is not a charismatic church. It is an angsty singer-songwriter, let's wrestle with our questions, why God kind of church. Um, it's different now, but when we first got there, that's what it was. Um, and so my wife wanted to be there 15 minutes early in the front. And so we're singing our song, little singer-songwriter, Jessica Hong. She was, she was doing the worship. And um, so I'm starting to sing, and I just start to cry, you know. So start, it's first it's like those kind of like those tears are here, there. And then it's like, <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and for whatever reason, I still try to sing. And so I'm still trying to sing while I'm doing this. My wife is like, dude, just, we want to stay here, right? Um, but then as I'm singing, all of a sudden the words that I have, become different. They're not my words anymore. They become these sounds, these utterances that are kind of coming up from underneath me. Um, and my wife is just like, dude, what is going on? And I'm, but I'm like, I'm, I don't even know what's happening, so I'm all covering my mother. <laughs> so we get home, she was like, what was that? I was like, I think I spoke in tongues. <laughs> She's like, you think you spoke in tongues? I was like, yeah, I think I spoke in tongues. She's like, you either did or you didn't. There's no, like, there's no in between here. I was like, I spoke in tongues. She was like, mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason why I go that, that long, 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 long story is that part of, I think, what was happening was my whole life, I had understood myself as an intellectual from the time I was like five, six years old. Um, I was a person of ideas, um, a person who understood my belonging through what I could contribute, through what I thought about. But when I, was, when, I was, when I entered into that moment in Seattle, I was stripped away from that intellectual community. I was stripped away from a community that, that said that was the thing that was most valuable to me. I faced all of these people that didn't know me, didn't know anything about me, that didn't look at me. And then I had to ask myself, who, who am I in the midst of this? And so somehow cleaning up all that crap twice in a row, it just broke me. And I had nothing else to offer. I had nothing else to do. I had nothing else to live into. And in that moment, I cried out in ways that I don't even understand. And yet God made, met me 
But God didn't meet me from outside. God met me from within my own life. So when I think about salvation as not a place, but a way, what I mean here is that there are not things that we do. What I mean is that salvation is a way, is, to say that salvation is a way is to allow ourselves to see the ways that we have built ourselves up, established ourselves, stabilized ourselves in this world in such a way that we actually resist the transformations that God is already doing in our lives. In a very real way, to say salvation is a way is more, it's like, it's almost as saying that in the incarnation, God lights a candle. God is the flame. That flame melds with wax. The wax becomes liquefied. And we are the rest of the candle. And we have to ask, we have to make this decision in a certain kind of way. Am I going to hold on to the rigidity and the certainty of my life? Or am I going to allow the heat to do its work? And am I going to, am I going to soften myself to this presence that is in my midst? and allow myself to flow and to move into the lives of these others who are next to me. Salvation is a way. It is a subjection of ourselves to the possibilities that we were made in the image of God and were intended to somehow live into the lives of others. Now again, what I want to suggest here that this way is not always about kenosis. It's not always about emptying because we live in a cultural social system where some people have had to empty themselves over and over and over again. And miraculously, somehow they always have something to give. And yet at the same time, what it is that society asks them to give is not actually what they need to be offering. And so when we think about salvation as a way, not a place, it allows us to begin to ask ourselves, what are the things, that, ways that my life might bend into, but also create? What are the things I need to recognize about my life in order to become, in order to kind of glorify, in order to speak in a new kind of tongue? I think one of the miracles that we see in this, this kind of assertion, this kind of tongues of fire, is not only about our individual kind of lives, but it's also about the ways, the miraculous ways that Christians and people who have a belief have articulated their own humanity in the midst of dehumanizing claims. Again, I've talked about this a little bit more, but again, if we think about the black church, they they over and over and over again heard these sermons from a book that said that they were meant to be slaves. And yet, somehow, in that very same book, they recognized themselves and gods as people who were to be free. People who ought to live and to work for their freedom. They saw the light. They felt the heat. They spoke in a tongue through their life in such a way that they worked for this freedom, both politically, socially, but also in their own lives through their care and love of one another. They created a space in the black church where people could walk in and they were known by name. They had something to offer. They had something to contribute. They created a social space of life and freedom. I want to say, to, perhaps, that we might say that the black church was a tongue of fire. It was a Pentecostal moment. So when we begin to think about what it means to say that salvation is a way, how we participate, we live back into what it is that God has lived into us through the word. It means what are the social spaces that we will create that we can begin to speak words of freedom, words of faithfulness, where the differences that, are, that make up our lives together can somehow be free to become something new rather than having to fight through all of the assumptions and presumptions of what my body is and isn't. What does it mean to create a space of two or three people where you are known and people know you? 
What does it mean to combine those two or three people with three or four others and say, you are known and we are known, but we need to know you. We need to learn your story. And as we begin to learn your story and who you are, we also begin to learn the things that afflict you, the pains that afflict you, the, difficulty, the difficulties that somehow you have in the world, and yet at the same time, you discover resources that you might have to offer. But then also at the same time, you learn your own weakness. So to say salvation in as a way is not to say that we achieve anything, and it means to see yourself as you are. As a creature, made from the ground, breathed into by this God, like those who are with you, but not like those who are with you, made to be for them, just as they were made to be for you, to eat, enjoy, and be enjoyed. And then as we begin to do that, as we begin to live into those Pentecostal possibilities in in the truth that the kingdom of God is already here, we can live in such a way that we are not trying to somehow preserve ourselves so that when we die, we get some sort of reward. But instead, our lives are a kind of slow uncovering We are slowly digging away the detritus, the filth, the garbage that somehow gives us some sort of comfort. And then what do we discover? But underneath it all is a spring of life. A word of freedom that has been knit into our bodies already that we must then struggle to hear and listen to. I am deaf in my left ear. And so so what that means is that there is only, there, is, there's a, there are like four notes in one key that I can actually hear and reproduce <laughs> vocally. And so what that means is when I'm singing a song, I'm like, and that's, probably, that's pretty much how I sound. We're broken. We're all, in a sense, slightly skewed in the fact that we can hear, but that does not diminish the fact that there is a song washing over me. The song has already been sung. The song is already moving within my body. To say that salvation is a way is to somehow attune my ear, my life, my heart, my body to that song. To say that we live in time is to say that we will not always sing in perfect pitch, in perfect rhythm, with that song all the time, but we don't have to. But at the same time, there is that moment, at least for me, every once in a while, where it's the right song, in the right key, in the right notes, and I feel like I'm singing. And I taste the salvation that is already here. I taste the kingdom of God that is running through my body. And so the next day when it's harder to hear, I remember that I had heard it. I remember that it was there. And I try to listen for that next moment. But the songs keep changing. The keys keep changing. And so the Christian life is not trying to preserve, make the whole world that one section of song that I can sing so that I can feel like I'm saved. It is living into all of those differences and different harmonies, keys, rhythms, so that I might discover all of the possibilities of what the salvation might look like. That I might make space in my life, in the life of my community, for the new things that God is doing for the new ways that God reveals to us just how profoundly God wanted to be with us. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're going to move into uh, some opportunity for Q&A for a few minutes before our session ends. Uh, and so we've got a recording going, so uh, we'll need you to, if you have a question or a comment, uh, raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Dr. Mann and I will hand it to you and try not to slay you in the spirit when we do. And uh, it happens. And uh, we'd like for you to ask your question, and then uh, Dr. Bannon will have a chance to respond for a couple minutes. So... If anyone would like to start, raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. So actually, I want to ask a question. So, oh yeah, here you go. Um, so kind of putting, putting a lot of things together um, and listening uh, to what you had to say together um, and the way that it brought some threads, uh, you know, talking about uh, who shall we be um, and we as bodies, and uh, the stories that you were telling today, and even, even starting talking about the early church and its kind of post-ascension state, right, coming together without the actual presence of the body of Christ with them, but then discovering in some sense that they are the body of Christ. I, I was struck by um, how that ties with each of the three uh, vignettes that you gave to us about each of those experiences happened in a church setting, right? Could you speak to the, uh, the way in which, and, and so this is kind of a question about the, um, the, t the title actually for today's talk is that salvation is, is not a way, but a, sorry, it's not a place, but a way. It seems that, um, it, I don't know, is that, I know you're trying to say that salvation is not like a place like heaven, that it's something more than that, but is there another sense in which salvation is a place or at least it ha it's a way that is in a place, that being within the body of Christ? No, I think that's a good question. Um, I would say that it is a way, it is a way in the, it is a place only insofar as it is an instrument. Um, you have, if you have a, a piano behind me, it takes up space, right? Um, it has a kind of potentiality. It's, it's strong and it's engineered in order to do something particular, right? But in order for it to be piano and to live into its pianoness, right? There has to be motion. There has to be action. There has to be contact. There has to be skill. There has to be listening. There has to be hearing. Um, and so I think in some ways, I think wanting to press this idea of a place, not a way, is that it, a way always requires a body. Um, it always requires a point of contact. It requires particularity. It, requ it requires a gathering of people. But if we do not, but if, but if we mistake the place for the end, we actually don't know what it is that we're doing in the place. And then we think that simply because we're in the place, we're justified. So, so I, are you saying then that the church is merely an instrument? That's kind of what I'm asking about, the church as the place in which... What do you mean by church? Uh, the community of faith, whenever it gathers, um, th this is in some ways a church right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess to some extent I would. I would say that a church, a community of people that, um, that allow themselves to justify racism, sexism, um, homophobia... Uh, just go on, you can go down the list, and yet at the same time, every, because they gather every Sunday and say Jesus' name, they are nothing but an instrument sitting on a stage. Because they think the name is what they are. I'm sorry, this is one last question. So can I live into the way without the church? You cannot live, well, you can't live into the way without people. Yeah. Um, the way that I would, the way that I, I talk about this sometimes with my students when we get to the church, because um, generally, like, it's a pretty compelling class, my intro to theology class, and they're like, yeah, we're all down for this. And then it's time, like, okay, now we get to the church. And they say, well, can I have church with my three friends who I really like? And um, my answer is usually no. Um, the reason for this is, I, is that, um, the, the church is not a, vol a purely voluntary society. And what I mean by this is that if the church is the body of Christ and it reinstantiates the image of God, it means that just like Adam and Eve wake up, they don't get to choose one another. 
that part of what it means in being made in the image of God is struggling with this one who's been given to you and the particularity of their lives and stories. Um, so yeah, so I would say no, like it's not possible without it. It's not an individual, an individualized kind of way of being. Um, but at the same time, I think we want to be attentive to um, what our bodies and lives are oriented to, um, other than just being together. Is there another? So my question is, um, really, how do you find the energy to keep going in really exhaustive white spaces where you like have to assert yourself, or you just do assert yourself over and over and over again um, to seemingly no avail? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, I th that's a good question. I, I think a while ago I learned I mean, this is going to sound a little cynical, but I've, I've accepted that some people simply want to die. That they would rather choose death. Um, the image I already have, y'all remember, like, I'm sure this is a good, I'm sure everyone's seen Lord of the Rings. Most people have seen Lord of the Rings. It feels like a Lord of the Rings kind of crowd. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means, actually. Um, but, you know, that, that image of Gollum holding the ring as he falls into the lava, like, I feel like that's... I feel like that's some of these spaces. Um, and, and so what that means, and at the same time, I can't choose, I can't choose my people all the time, right? Um, I find myself at SPU, which is its own kind of place, um, and I wrestled with the place for a long time. I tried to get out many times, <laughs> and God just pulled me back, and me and God have had some words about it. And yet at the same time, I also know that my work is doing work. Um, that, um, that it is creating these kind of small spaces of freedom for people, different ways of imagining what God might mean, that, that Christian life is actually an option um, in some regards. Um, but I've also learned that also, but just because an institution doesn't want to change, um, just because individual people don't want to change doesn't mean that I have to die with them. And so part of the, what keeps me alive is actually is, is maintaining deep connections with people who want me to live, um, who remind me that the work I'm doing, that I'm participating in the kingdom that is already here. Um, but it's hard. It's not gonna, it's, it's, I'm not going to lie, it's hard. Um, and so I exercise, I ride my bike. I get like, and I ride my bike, and I'm like, ah, okay, I can do it again. And then, but then at the same time, in the same way that a lot of these other stories, I can't not do it. I don't know what that looks like. My life doesn't make sense if I don't do it. Um, and so that's all I can do. Somebody else? So I know we've been talking a lot about bodies and race, um, but I wanted to ask the same question in the sense of your faith and how you embody the same things when now your faith has experienced or encountered this difference. How do you then model that for other people that you maybe would say like their faith practices or maybe the dying practices? How do you embody that in your faith practices. I know we've been talking about bodies and all of that, but can you speak a little bit into like your faith journey specifically? Um, you mean faith as in the things that I believe in the midst of people who maybe believe something different? Kind of how you changed, like you both and your wife maybe changed a little bit in the ways that you perceived how to like follow Christ or the way that salvation looked to you and now like raising your hand and falling out in the spirit, like how that all kind of transformed you to today. Yeah. Um, I think in a lot of ways, that's a great question. I think in a lot of ways what all of those things have done for me um, is reminded me of how little I know. Um, and so I hold all knowledge, all practices lightly. 
and, and so prayer for me is a kind of, prayer oftentimes for me is actually more asking questions than offering, um, than offering things. Um, prayer and, and practices of faith are moments of discovery. So I've, I've, I've become much more engaged in kind of artistic practices of like creative writing, of painting, of building things that somehow I have to make something with my hands and see something. Um, but in that creative process, oftentimes I don't actually know what I'm gonna, what's going to happen. And, and in that creative process, I'm always reminded of the way that God is building and layering um, and clarity comes into being. Um, and so I, ch I try to inhabit that not only in kind of these more individual spaces, but I try to inhabit that in classrooms, in encounters with other people. Like I, I, while I might say, like I kind of say definitively, I and mean, it sounds a little cynical, that people are dying. Um, but I don't know who's dying and who's not, actually. But I, I smell death. But I don't know who's going to choose life. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know the death in my own life. Um, and so part of, so for me, in a way, faith is about admitting what I don't know um, and listening for what I might come to know. I got time for one more. Um, what do you believe <clears throat> sorry, are the necessities for salvation and do you think other people are included as a necessity for salvation? Necessities for salvation? Um, I'm, like, I'm, I'm hearing in that like is there like something that you have to believe or utter for salvation? I'm trying to clarify. No, just like you're talking about how salvation is a way um, and it includes other people and even the church. So, like, just at the, min the bare minimal, like, what are the bare necessities for salvation, and do they include other people? Are other people necessary um, for my salvation? Hmm. Um, well, at least one other person is necessary because Jesus is real. So, so, that's, so that would be the first part. So, yes, someone else is necessary. Um, but yes, I would say that um, other people um, are somehow um, critical to a life that is being saved um, and living into that salvation. Um, as far as like what's necessary, um, I don't know, it's kind of a tricky question because I think in some ways, as soon as you start to, as soon as you start to kind of put put pieces down, you also are kind of beginning to de delineate and differentiate who is and who isn't, right? Um, and so part of what I've tried to lay out is, is to some extent to say that God has already saved us. So what is necessary for salvation is not to say what is it, what can be, how can salvation be achieved the question of what is necessary for salvation is how do I live into this thing that God has already done in me? And I think whatever, whatever that looks like, and, I'll, and I, t I talked about James Baldwin yesterday, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention him again. Um, what salvation looks like is are those things that makes us more human, more loving, more free, um, but those things are never without the one who is love, who is free, um, either. Is that abstract enough for you? Well, Dr. Bantam, thank you for your time with us this week. Would you join me in expressing our appreciation? Thanks to all of you for being here both this morning and throughout the week. Have a great rest of your day.